Hello everybody, this is Nathan Crane and today I am honored and excited to be sitting here with my dear friend, Grandmother Flora de Mayo. Grandmother Flora de Mayo is a world-renowned healer and wisdom keeper, originally from Nicaragua and actually who lives uh, close to me here in New Mexico. I've had the honor of learning from her, spending time with her, being out to her uh, nonprofit uh, property which is known as The Path and experiencing ceremony with her and I can share with you that she has so much insight and wisdom and just key understandings that we can learn from to help us in our lives during this challenging time that we're going through with pandemic and crisis and so forth but I think really just the wisdom you have to share for us in general, um, especially through your profound spiritual connection, the, the connection that you have to the unseen realms, I think is incredibly valuable for all of us right now. So thank you for coming and being here and, and uh, having this little sit down with me. Thank you so much, Nathan. It is a great honor to be here with you. Thank you so much. And yeah. before we get into the interview, I want to just share um, uh, her nonprofit is called The Path. The website is followthegoldenpath.org. Um, there is uh, fundraising you can support with there. You can donate and also learn about the wonderful projects that are happening there. I highly encourage you to go to the website and get involved. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Now, when in your life, how early, how old were you or how young were you when you first realized that you had this uh, ability to see the unseen, to connect with the dimensions of spirit, if you will. Mm -hmm. My first experience that I could remember was when I was two years old and my father passed away. Mm. I did not understand the word passing away, but I understood that one day he was physically there in the house with us. Another moment, he was in the casket. He was buried. But that evening, he was back in the house. Wow. And that was my first, first experience where I saw the person in the physical, saw the person after he passed away. The body was... Um, uh, they did the um, the prayers and everything when he passed away, the sacred bathing there in the house and being in Central America, you, you do not stay any longer than like 24 hours or less before you're buried. And so I watched all of that. I watched the funeral, I watched the casket, mm. I watched everything. But when I went to bed at night, I saw my father in our bedroom Wow! and I was really really happy because what I had seen in the past 24 hours was did not relate to what I was seeing yeah and so the following morning I spoke to my mom and the thing about my mom and my brothers and sisters my mom said to me that I was able to make sentences at a very young age. And um, my mom was very intuitive. So she understood what make-believe was, imagination was, or, yeah. you know, you ask the child questions. Mm. So, so my mom did that. You know, she said to me, daughter, what exactly did you see so I described it and it wasn't like I saw my father walking or saying anything to me but he was like I would say it looked to me my memories it looked to me like it was almost a physical form wow. but he was standing in the bedroom mm -hmm. because he had a very very rapid transition he actually died of a heart attack wow. and it wasn't just like a heart attack it was this massive heart attack he just was up one moment and the next moment he was gone mm. like that so 
you know, sometimes death comes to us and it takes a long time. Yeah. But for my father, he was unprepared. Mm. You know, you never prepare for death, but he was unprepared. <laughs> yeah. It was so quick. My mom was unprepared and and none of us, you know, everybody was, you know, very upset because it was like he got up, had breakfast, he was with us and like before noon he passed away. So you have many uh, that's one story. You were two years old. You remember your, your father, right? you know, his spirit coming back into the room with you. Mm -hmm. But you have many, many, many examples like that. Right, right, right. But that is like what I would say earliest because I know that he died when I was two years old. When was it that you like cognitively like understood what was happening versus did you? I mean, at two years old. Yes. You did. I, okay. Yeah. When I. Uh, personally started putting things together I overheard my brothers and sisters talk about um, different experiences that they had and of course my mom had 15 children I'm the youngest <laughs> so wow. by the time you get to the older brother yeah uh, down the road we're all like two years in between you know it's quite a journey up there <laughs> the older child yeah. is almost an adult so um, there were these conversations going, going on between my older brothers and my sister. And they were talking about a particular family member. Mm. It was actually my grandfather's brother. And he was known, Tata is the word for grandfather in Central America. So his name was Tata Julio. And I'm listening to the conversation. Maybe I'm 11 or 12 years old. Mm. And um, I'm listening, and one of the things that we learn at a very early age is that we respect when somebody's speaking, whether it's your older brother or anybody. Even my sister that was two years older than me, I had to respect, give her the space for her to speak, and then, you know, then um, I would have a turn to, to speak. So when my turn came, when my mom said to me, child, do you have something to say? Because I started to get giggly and, and antsy and moving and wiggling <laughs> around in my seat. And I said, yes, 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 yes. I said to my mom and my brothers and sisters, I remember that. I remember it. I remember it like it happened not too long ago. Mm. And both, all my brothers and sisters said, oh girl, hush up because you weren't even born. Wow. And I was like, what? What do you mean I wasn't born? But wait, wait, let me explain. Let me show you what I remember. Let me tell you about I re what I remember. And at that very, very moment, Nathan, mm -hmm. I went into this place of recollecting. Yeah. Okay, something that happened before I was born. So my wow. brothers and sisters are like little kids. They're like four and five years old, whatever, um, you know, seven years old. And they had gone to Tata Julio's mm -hmm. to visit. And I started describing what the street looked like, what his house looked like, what Tata Julio looked like, wow. and what specifically Tata Julio said to one of my brothers. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters were like, they couldn't speak. And so they said to my mom, Mom, so what happened here? You know, that she could remember something from when we were little, but she wasn't even born. Right. You know, it was like maybe I was born like 10, 15 years later. Right? Wow. So, um, so my mom, you know, gave everybody a really, really good explanation. And what the explanation that my mom did was that we as humans before we come into the physical body that we do journey to the families that we want to pick mm. and i remember when i was telling what i remembered i remember seeing myself like i was floating above my brothers and sisters wow i was like floating yeah so my mom said took everybody back and said, look, 
The child said she was floating, you know. So sh it, it just goes to assure us that she was not in a physical body. Right. You know, she was there in her spirit, uh, playing with everybody, um, enjoying, you know, everybody, and made the decision that this is the family that she wanted to be with, you know, after all of that. Well, you, you sparked a memory that I haven't thought of in a while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it's appropriate for the time we're in because so many people are losing loved ones right now. And there's Absolutely. so much fear of this virus and dying from it. And even though millions of people die around the world from all kinds of things mm -hmm. all the time, yeah. you know, cancer and heart disease and walking outside and getting hit by a bus and you name it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. death is a, a part of everyday life. And for mm -hmm. some reason, this has us gripping to our seats more than anything else, you know, for, for various reasons we don't necessarily need to go into, but um, it is something that we're dealing with. And so many people are losing loved ones during this time. Um, and I'm just remembering when my grandfather on my dad's side was really sick and he was, you know, basically... Uh, I think my dad called me and uh, I was living in California and he had said, you know, um, grandpa's going to pass soon, you know, could be any day now. They've given him maybe a week mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, we knew it was coming. And I sat in my bed that night and I was meditating and I just had this strong connection to him and, and I all of a sudden was like I could, you know, feel and, and almost see him, not as vivid as you're describing, like seeing your dad when he came, mm -hmm. but I could sense that this, uh, this spirit was his. And I just, the first words that came out was, are you okay? Uh, is there anything I can do mm -hmm. to help you? And he said, he said, I'm fine. Uh, I'm free now. And, and everything's fine. Everything's okay. I'm happy and I'm free. And that uh, in that moment, I knew that he had passed, mm -hmm. like just from the words that he said and the feeling that I had. And I woke up the next morning and then I got a call from my dad and heard that he had passed. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the time of when I had that meditation with him and then when his actual time of, of death was, it was only like a 20 minute difference mm -hmm. between... Uh, I, I connected with his energy, his soul, if you will, about 20 minutes after he passed. It was yeah. like sometime after midnight. I don't remember the exact time. Mm -hmm. But it was such a, you know, profound spiritual revelation for me that uh, something I had knew from my studies, but it was really, you know, from studying with Buddhist masters and mm -hmm. Zen monks and doing lots of meditation, lots of teachers over the years and and but that was really my first experience with like the next realm of life and knowing that even though we do die in this world our soul transitions to another life and that it's okay you know the answer came from him i'm okay i'm happy i'm everything's fine i'm free yeah. You know, and that made me feel so like yeah. so good because yeah. he was suffering so bad. The of last course. months of mm -hmm. his life was just because of his lifestyle of drinking and smoking and lots of fried chicken and you know, he really went to the max <laughs> with his lifestyle. <laughs> the last few lives of the last few months of his life were really miserable. But, you know, I think that whatever reassurance hopefully that has for people is that yeah, we do transition out of this life the next we may not know exactly what that is, but, you know, from so many experiences I know you've had, mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe you can share with people who are, you know, afraid right now, who are experiencing uh, just immense fear or uncertainty, uh, a little bit more from, from your wisdom, your perspective of, of maybe what's going on and also, you know, what can we do to, to understand this time we're in a little better. It's, um, it's such a, how should I say, such an enormous question, hmm. Nathan, because um, many of us around the globe have, in, in our 
lineage, the way that we are raised, depending on our religion. There's just so many different um, ways that it is explained what happens when we, when we cross, when we leave our physical body and journey into the, into the spirit world. But one of the things that I have seen in my lifetime, I have followed people in my family, followed meaning I had always been very attentive to their everyday life, mm -hmm. their spirituality, mm -hmm. and I find out that depending on who they were and what they believed in, 99% of the time when they cross into the invisible world, that is what happens to them. Mm. For I'll give you an, a really, really good example. My mother-in-law, which I knew for like 53 years, okay, when she passed away, she was a very, very, very devout Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. She was very, very strict and very, very devout. And she had spoken about what was going to happen to her when she, when she died. And I always listened to what she said, but she would say to me that she had been a good Christian, that she had obeyed all the laws, that when she dies, she was going to be in the kingdom. Mm. And whenever she had an opportunity to speak to me, which, you know, was like every once in a while, I perhaps maybe remember in my life, maybe three times mm -hmm. that we sat down and we talked about this. It was she initiated the conversation. I, I did not ask. And so, so my mother-in-law, I watched her um, from before the time that she passed away. Watched her meaning she was 96 years old. I was her caretaker, primarily her caretaker. There were other people that came in and helped her out. But I had a lot of time to dialogue with her and she was this very scholarly lady. Mm -hmm. She was a graduate from NYU and from Columbia. She had like two degrees. She read every day, big books, yeah. and she was always reading. But when it came to her religion and what she believed, I don't know how many times she read the Bible. She read it throughout her life. Mm -hmm. The Bible, she was just constantly reading the Bible. Um, no, she was Jehovah's Witness or she, Christian? No, she was Jehovah's Witness. She was Witness, Jehovah's Witness. But they have sure. their, their books. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. some slight no, different no, flavor, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so one day she woke up and it looked to me like she was out of body. Mm. Okay? She was like unsteady on her feet. She wanted to sit for a while. She felt like um, she wasn't in her body. That's not the word she used. I use that word. But she's sitting on the bed, and she said to me, Flor de Mayo, I'm having a hard time waking up. That was her saying, I'm out of my body. Mm. But I could see her, mm. that she's out of body. So I said to her, Grandma, are you, like, okay? She said, I'm just having a hard time um, waking up. Um, but she said, hey, do you... Do you know anything about dreams? <laughs> I mean, 53 years. <laughs> and I said to her, of course, I know a lot about dreams. Right. But you see, I'm not a Columbia graduate, right? I didn't go to NYU. Yeah. So she's looking at me like, okay, you know a lot about dreams. So she said, can I tell you what I dreamed? So I said, sure. So she told me her dream. And I looked at her and I said to her, Grandma, 
what do you think that the dream means? Because it was a very, very vivid vision that she mm. experienced. Mm -hmm. But she's calling it a dream. But it was very, very vivid, very obvious with the message. To make a very, very long story short, and because I don't have permission from the family to, you know, to go into details, um, my mother-in-law ended up um, crossing, like, I believe that it was like four months after. Mm. Okay. And you kind of knew at that time that, that that's what the I vision knew, or the I dream meant. I knew exactly meant. what was going on. Yeah. I knew exactly. But you asked her instead of saying it and to she, her. And she told me. She also got she, it. She also got it. That she, she was, also got it. It was her time to go. In the midst of her not being in her body, yeah. she was very clear. You know, her yeah. light body was very clear. And she was communicating to me that she only had a short time. Mm. You know, out of respect, I didn't say to her, how long do you have? I didn't say anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Now you can see her energy body and that told you specifically what's going on. Yeah. Mm. And so um, she started to become very energized and very um, mechanical, almost animated. And <laughs> she started taking care of last minute things. Uh. And it was so beautiful to watch her do this. She went through like old mail, old photographs, writing letters, not telling anybody that she was going to die, but writing letters saying, hey, we had a great time when we were kids. You know, you were such a wonderful friend. Mm. I just want to tell you that I love you and I thank you. That kind of letter. Wow. I mean, she just did all of these things. <laughs> yeah. And she made... Um, a lot of, there was a lot of communication about um, I want this to go here and I want that to go there and don't forget this is for you and don't forget this is for my son right so it was that kind of communication so one day my mother-in-law became sick and again I don't have the permission to speak about how she became sick but it was on a Friday morning mm -hmm. and she passed away on a Sunday wow. I'm sorry on a Monday Wow! so when we took her to the hospital and they did all of the evaluation my husband said to the doctor but of course it showed in <clears throat> her medical records that she was a Jehovah's Witness mm -hmm. and they have certain protocols about um, blood transfusion and things like that. So my husband, um, you know, spoke to the doctor and said, you know, my mom is a devout Jehovah's Witness. And uh, so the doctor said, um, but I, I need to speak to your mom. And, and so we all went into the room to uh, when the doctor spoke to her and the doctor explained to her what was going on with her body and up to this moment, she did not want to take any kind of pain medicine. Mm -hmm. But when she said to the doctor, how long do I have? I mean, in a very clear way. Yeah. The doctor said, well, he said, in cases like this, it could be 20, 24 hours. It could be 48 hours. Wow. And he said to her, uh, do you want to, you know, do something about the pain? Because I could make you very comfortable, he yeah. said, you know. And so she kind of thought about it. And um, my husband went out to speak with the doctor. And I stayed in the room with her. And she smiled at me. Mm. And she said to me, hey, Flor de Mayo, this is it, isn't it? This is it. Wow. And I said to her, yes, this is it. And we were both smiling. <laughs> it was like we knew this secret between the two of us. Yeah. And so my husband comes in and she says to my husband, she said, you know, she said, I really want to go home. She said, if I'm going to die, I want to die in my bed. Wow. And my husband said to her, to her mom, I will see 
what is the best that I can do, I'll, I'll go and talk to the doctor. And she said to me at the same time, she said, look, why don't you go to my house and get me, she already had a list. Uh -huh. She had, she wanted her Victoria's Secret pink pajamas hmm. with fluffy f feathered slippers <laughs> and a faux alligator bag <laughs> for travel <laughs> into, into the into the spirit world. Uh -huh. She's, and then she said to me... She wanted to go comfortable and in style. <laughs> and, in style <laughs> and in style. She said to me, don't forget my makeup. Don't forget my nail polish. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm saying to her, no, 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 I won't, I won't forget. And so um, I promised her that I was going to get her all these things. And by this time, my husband is calling up everybody, the grandchildren and the, his sister, Hmm. And so there are uh, four grandchildren. Uh, none of the great-grandchildren were there, but the sister was there. And so everybody came together, and everybody started futzing with her by putting on the nail polish, combing her, putting on lipstick, just getting her ready for the journey. Yeah. And it was so incredibly sweet wow. to see... Um, to see her at the age of 96 and she said to me I want to look my best mm. when I leave my physical body yeah and I watched her when they wrapped her with the sheet and and so she left like that yeah. And it was so sweet. So I have these like really, really sweet memories of her. However, she did have quite a journey traveling. After she left her body? After she left okay. her body, but she made it to this place that was like a paradise. So this, so you've talked with her since. You've talked with her I spirit saw, I saw since. her in visions and dreams after that. Okay. And it wasn't until some time later, and of course I don't have permission from the family to go into detail, but eventually she made it to this place that's like a paradise. Huh. And she was like this very good swimmer, and she loved the water. And I see her under a waterfall in like this beautiful, beautiful kind of jungle scene, and she is so happy and she's waving at me because I'm like the only one in the jungle with her <laughs> and she's going like this to me and I shout at her and I say oh I'm so happy that you're so happy so she made it to this place wow. that she always talked about that when she died she was going to be in paradise <laughs> for, forever and ever so when I speak and I think about my mother-in-law I think about her you know, in paradise, which is really sweet. What Very an incredible sweet. story. Yeah. Um, it leads me to, to a, another question is, um, do you believe there's such thing as hell when you leave this body? Is there such thing a place where a soul can go to a burning inferno with being tortured for the rest of your life because you're a bad person? No, no, I, I, don't, I don't personally, this is only my personal opinion, I don't believe in that because I've never, never, never experienced anything like that. Um, With all the spirits you've talked to, all the souls all that have the, passed. All the experiences. What I have seen, Nathan, which is really, really important for us humans to keep in mind, that whatever we do in this life, okay, whether it's good or indifferent, whether it's um, monastic or you know, doing your mundane stuff, mm -hmm. okay? There is a, a, we make decisions as human beings and the decisions are, do I do the right thing or do I go here and do what's not right? Mm. I mean, do I progress spiritually or do I set myself back spiritually? Yeah. And how we set ourselves back are through vices. Yeah. Okay. I have seen people that 
in their physicalness had had incredible vices. Yeah. I had plenty growing up. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that if we don't make amends yeah. with these and move away from it and try to cure and heal all of that, yeah. that we go into a place which is like the closest thing to your question. Mm -hmm. Is there a hell? But people that die that are like, and I'm just going to use one example just because I've had experience with this. A few experiences I watched and I, and, I, and I was called to come and help. There are these um, beings in the spirit world that are like very, very dark. Yeah. Their light mm. is obscure. Interesting. And they don't look like humans. They have a different form. Mm. They're almost like... And, and I'm just going to say like... Um, kind of like you can put a couple of creatures together in one. If you're a Christian, you might call them demons. Right, Is that, right, okay. right. And let's say, for example, that the person... Uh, that died was a sex addict. Mm -hmm. This is a vice, mm -hmm. you know, where nothing happens in the mind but gratification. Mm. And so, in the midst of this energy, there are these creatures, and they will take over you. They take over the land, they take over the house, they take over the children mm. and it is like an energy that's out of control while you're alive while you're alive okay but when i was called in a situation i've talked to quite a few people who have sh shared that exact personal experience mm -hmm. yeah so the, you know yes. what i am speaking yeah. about mm -hmm. yeah so when i had been called in a situation like this my first time, I was 24 years old, and I was called to come and help this family. Mm. And the young girl was 15. And I stayed with her in the room, and when I started experiencing seeing this creature, I went into prayer. It was such an experience that it's undescribable, Nathan. Mm. Fear did not come in me. Okay, because I always, I am always in prayer and I trust in the prayer and I trust in, in my protection from yeah. my ancestors. And so I have such trust that when I saw this creature, I went into prayer, spontaneous prayer, and I asked my God, my beloved creator to help me mm. and to help me with the situation and to help me with this young girl. And so this energy wow. came through me yeah. in my, you know, in my, um, in my call to God, in my spontaneous prayer. And this enormous amount of energy came from the above and it went right through my crown went down into my feet, came back, and shot it through my hands. And I remember that my hands automatically went like this. Yeah. And the light, I saw the light coming, the energy coming out of my hands. And when my hands went like that and the light came out, it hit this obscure being. Wow. And when it hit, it started to break the obscurity into light. Wow. And the light started ascending. Hmm. And so the more that I aimed at this creature, the more that I was able to do what automatically I was doing without really knowing other than the faith in God and the faith in help me and to help this young girl. 
So I made this this creature that might have been like 14, 20 feet tall, okay? Wow. It took up the whole space of the house. And I got rid of it. Mm. Wow. And so everything was like fine. And then early in the morning, um, we went downstairs and I said to the grandma, everything is okay. I was able to get rid of whatever energy was there, blah, 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 blah. And I started to walk home and I'm saying to myself, what exactly happened? Yeah. Because who... Who does anybody know that knows what I know? Yeah. I was confused. Mm. I'm 24 years old. I'm 24 years old. And this girl was having... Why did they call you for her? Okay. Yeah, what was so she having? So this is what was happening. Uh -huh. This creature was having sex with her every night. Jeez. He was penetrating her every night. And the That's child crazy to was think screaming. About screaming screaming all night long oh my gosh and so she lived with her grandma yeah and her grandma was very very upset and the grandma came looking for me sounds like some horror story you'd see on some like, sci-fi like tv, like TV television no, but this show is or like something a true right story yeah this is totally yeah. true that's crazy absolutely true and and so the other part of the story is this that we have to really listen to the other part of the story so time passes and i don't know how long down the road it could have been six months it could have been a year i don't remember i don't know but the grandmother comes back looking for me and out of respect because i'm 24 years old i say to the grandma okay i'll come to your house and talk to your granddaughter but i was irritated as a human and i'm saying to myself i can't I can't do this again. Mm. I can't do another overnight <laughs> and, and, and pray to remove this beast out of her room. I'm saying to myself, I can't do that. I was just convinced that it was over. Yeah. I was not going to do that. So we get to the house and the young girl is in the kitchen. And I say to her, I didn't say hello, how are you? I didn't say anything. I said... What happened? That's how I approached her. And she said to me, Nathan, I liked it. Hmm. I missed him. Wow. So she brought this energy back into the, into the room. And I looked at the grandmother and I said, I can't do anything anymore. Wow. I said, everything is between your granddaughter and this you know, I don't know what word I use. I didn't have the language, yeah. you know, to, to say whatever it was. So that's kind of the way that that went. And in my life, I have been called seven times mm -hmm. to come without, I don't even know the people that call me. It's like a mystery to me. Yeah. But to come and to take care of these, you know, and, and, and vices could be anger. Mm. It could be so many things that we don't even think about. You know, that we could, you know, what is it that makes us human to be so angry in the house with children? So are you saying that in those cases, the people that have had those vices like extreme anger or in that case, the, the sexual mm -hmm. uh, tendency, uh, that addiction, if you will, in at least those seven cases, they were not doing anything to clear themselves out of these vices. And they all had like one of those dark energy beings one around them? One of those them. dark energy. Wow. And not only that, but some of them are even smaller. And they will t torment you. I mean, it's like, it's like a nightmare every night. And so by cleaning the healing, the, the do anger it, from the inside. Doing personal, personal, um, you know, doing some, you know, good, and, and I don't even have the word, whatever it is that we need to do uh, to help us to, to be more in peace, 
to be more um, honoring mm. to ourselves, yeah. um, you know, depending on our religion, what is it that we need to do to bring peace and harmony in ourselves? Which is usually a lot to do with healing the emotional trauma that exactly. we have as exactly. children. Exactly, because right? everybody, everybody has had trauma. Sure. You know, when I speak to people about my trauma, it's like, what? And I could tell you what <laughs> big trauma for me mm -hmm. that it's always very difficult for me to talk about mm. is immigration. Uh -huh. That for me just takes me down into this crying, crying, and I can't speak anymore. Wow. So uh, that to me is just like an energy that I don't know when it's going to disappear. But I feel it like over and over yeah. and over again. Sadness, it's grief. It's sadness, it's yeah. grieving. It's, it's, um, it's just thinking about, you know, being a child, being in a strange country, learning a new language. I mean, it's just all these difficulties in school and just the, the whole difficulty. But I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. I'm extremely, extremely happy. And my coming to the United States, it wasn't like I walked from Nicaragua into New York City. No. My family, I came in an airplane. Mm. I came to Miami. That was the port that we came into. Yeah. And from Miami, we went to New York City. Mm -hmm. I had my great aunt waiting for us in New York City. So we all, one or two at a time, between 1945 and 1964, we all came to the United States mm. like that. Which is very so difficult as a child being here. It, it was extremely difficult. Yeah. You know, when you're young and you're used to this little paradise in Central America. There's prejudice and racism and you don't know the language and it was the just, unknown. It was so difficult. Yeah. I mean, so, so difficult. Wow. I mean, ju I, I had no idea that it was so difficult for me until I started to like really, really look at the migration of Central American people coming into the United States. It kind of like stopped me. In fact, maybe four years ago, there was a, I, I was speaking at a university and this young, young 70 year, 17 year old young man said to me, Grandma Flor de Mayo, you're an immigrant. And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. I'm saying to myself in my mind, I'm an immigrant, uh -huh. right? Yeah. But before that, I didn't even have that word in my vocabulary. Ah, but the young man brought that to me. And I looked at my daughter and I looked at my granddaughter and I started to cry mm. because I was putting myself with everybody that was migrating, Yeah, you know? But before that, for whatever reason, I didn't think of myself as an immigrant. Well, and people think of you lesser than, or try, you know, call you names, or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah I mean, yeah, getting, yeah. getting my wife's, you know, papers here, she's originally from Mexico, she's been in the United States for like 20 years, and, yeah. you know, going through the process of getting her, um, uh, her green card and legalization and all of that. I mean, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It's, it's yeah. and s thousands of dollars and paperwork this thick. Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, you have to have an attorney that knows everything. And it's just like, you know, people who have to go and through and that. And then it's ch children, yeah, yeah, you know, that are in school that are being bullied that yeah. are, so yeah. the emotional trauma that comes with that yeah. Is, yeah. is unbearable yeah. for yeah. so many. Yeah. And, and it lasts generations. And yet we're all immigrants. <laughs> you know, my, my, a big part of my family came from Denmark. Yeah, you know, yeah. they immigrated. I'm an immigrant even yeah. though I was born here, right? Yeah. So we're all immigrants. We're yeah. all the same. Yeah. It's like we have to get this idea out of our minds that anyone coming from another country is different than us. 
they're not. They're human beings, yeah. all born on planet Earth. And the right? only thing we want is something better for yeah. for the children. Like, for example, the reason that my mom brought us to the United States is because she had four daughters. Mm. And she wanted her daughters to have the right to say no to sex. Yeah. She had 15 children. Yeah. She couldn't say no. Wow. She wanted us to have the right to fall in love. Mm. She wanted us to have the right to say, no, I don't want to live with you. No, I don't want to have sex. To make these decisions. You didn't have In those Central rights. America, we can't do that. We wow. don't have a voice. Wow. So she, after my father died, um, she started, you know, um, thinking maybe I should get the girls out of here. What an know? amazing mother you had that, yeah, that yeah, helped absolutely. It, 15 children, I can yeah, only imagine. Yeah, she just, well, by the time my dad died, there were 10 of us mm. living. And the, the other five children died of... Um, uh, childhood diseases and wow. epidemics that were going on in, uh, in Central America. Well, going back to, I want to just shift gears a little bit to what you said earlier, is like, you know, the, the vices we have in our lives and, and then also transition back to this, this fear of death that we have as a society because no one wants to talk about death because we're, you know, afraid of the unknown and so forth. And um, one, I guess we'll get there in a second, is you had said, Whatever you can do to to think good, to be good, to you know the 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 explanation you said where you know basically God came through you, shot the light. You know that's actually almost a very similar like qigong practice, right? Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. Ming Tong Gu, Master of Ming course, Tong. We we know him really well, <laughs> He's right? He's my friend. Yeah. <laughs> and and the Absolutely. practices that come oh, from yeah. five thousand year old you know China mm -hmm. ancient qigong practices are are very similar to that, where Absolutely. you're bringing in the energy, source energy into your body mm -hmm. and you're spreading it out. But I guess my point in, in bringing that up is, you know, whether it's meditation, you said you're constantly in prayer, mm -hmm. um, the beautiful ceremonies I've been to of yours that, that you conduct, um, you know, the, you know, even for me, exercise is actually a form of, it's a, it's a very, uh, sometimes very meditative and other times very spiritual for me. Even mm -hmm. sometimes I look, I go so intense in like CrossFit, for example, I'm on the floor laying there dying, you know, sweating and drooling. And, but actually in that moment, I feel like bliss and so good and I connect to source. And it's like you go from this intensity, which life can be very intense at times, very intense. to the state of just bliss and calmness and total relaxation and peace. Um, in a very short period of time. And so for me, you know, that intense exercise, you know, hiking in the mountains, but a lot of deep inner spiritual, mental, emotional healing work, right, to continue to heal those uh, emotional trauma, those vices and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, I mean, I grew up, you know, uh, addicted to alcohol and drugs and sex and uh, pharmaceuticals and bad food and you know I was very very lucky to make it past 18 years old mm -hmm. you know a lot of people didn't think I was gonna live past 18 and mm -hmm. when and um, but that's when I started changing my life right and started meditating and started learning from spiritual teachers and doing interviews like this to you know soak up as much <laughs> as I can to help improve myself and as part of that then you start wanting to give back right and helping right. others and right. I think that's another part of that path of healing is as you heal yourself, then wanting to share that to help others heal. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, and I guess that kind of leads to, to the next piece, which is relevant with, with the pandemic and, and people dying and so forth, is this fear of death. Why do we have such a fear of death? Why does nobody want to talk about it? Why is there, uh, you know, just this... Uh, if you're religious, you, believe, you, know, you, do, you do good, you go to heaven, you do bad, you go to hell, right? That's one religious belief. There's other beliefs, you know, of reincarnation and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, it's, as this, your mother-in-law, for example, who found her paradise, right? right? right. Um, but, but why is it that, that it's such a taboo thing in society? Because I think uh, in some cultures, it's not. It's very well talked about in the family and understood and not afraid at right. all. Right. It's just understood as a part of life. Yeah. And so maybe you can share a little more on that. I, it, it's only my um, understanding 
I feel that when we go into a place of fear, it's because we really don't understand it. It's like the unknown. Mm. And because we don't understand it, there is like this block. But if we want to understand it, we could go into the holy books, depending on what you believe, mm -hmm. okay? And just become buddies with how is it or what is it in what you believe? And let's say you don't believe in anything, okay? What's the worst that can happen? You're here one moment and then you're not. If you don't <laughs> believe in anything, right? Yeah. 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 So, and it's okay. Yeah. As long as we're happy with what we believe. For myself, I'm really looking forward to that experience <laughs> because I've had so many experiences as a physical human that I'm saying, whoa, this is going to be like a nice journey, you know? You've traveled so the world, I, you've I'm had so, so many, yeah. I am so looking forward to <laughs> having incredible experiences, that and, and communicating, you know, mm. after the fact, you Interesting. Know? So it's, it's all good, you know, it's all good. Well, I, you're so much more in touch with the unseen realms than I think most people. I've had a few experiences in my life, but not every day, you know? And I think most people have one or zero, you know, in their life. So that unknown of like, okay, what if there is a hell? What if I did do bad? I think mm -hmm. that belief mm -hmm. is a big part of the fear, right? right? right. Is that, especially in, you know, a, millions of people who are or potentially billions of people who have that belief that if if they haven't done everything right and they die they're going to go to hell the su the, pain, the thought of suffering in in a fiery inferno i think keeps people in in fear yeah yeah and so um we have to find something that it's comfortable for us to believe in mm. but i don't believe that I don't either. Yeah. I don't believe there's so a... I think we create hell here. This, when, when this we, being here is very tough. Yeah, I think... Surviving all of this is very tough. I think we either create our hell or we create our heaven on earth. We can That's create right. either one. And mm -hmm. I've lived in hell <laughs> growing up. <laughs> really bad hell. I mean, uh -huh. very, very, very bad. I don't need to go into all the stories. But also, I've, I've lived in heaven in the last, mm -hmm. you know, with my beautiful kids and my wife and the great work I get to do and the people I get to, you know, spend time with, like, now my life is so much closer to what heaven could be like when before it was hell. Right. You know, I really think we do create that in our lives here. Yeah, yeah. So we have to be very careful on what we dwell on, you know, and just stay in the center of things. Mm. This is one of the things that um, the beloved mother has said to me is, um, you know, keep walking. The road is clear, mm. you know, and when she speaks to me, she's talking to everybody, you know, and that's, you know, right now humanity is like at a crossroads, you know, I mean, there's so much stuff that's going on. Yeah. And it wasn't like we haven't been told. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've been told that this was going to happen, but some of us were like not even thinking about it. Okay. Right now, we're at the crossroads, okay? And we have a decision to make. Do we go back into the old ways? Mm. Okay, constantly polluting everything around us? Um, or do we find a new way of becoming a better Earth? Mm. Which, a better which might humanity. look like, which might look like what? Yeah, which might look like we have some time a rough time right now you know we're in it rough right now but before things can get better it's going to have to take all of us to move in a positive direction what are things we can do individually to to head in that direction to create a better earth we have to start thinking of what it is what is it in your heart that you would want for the future Mm. For, the, for the children of the future. For me, 
I think about all of the animals that are disappearing. I think about all of the plant life that is disappearing. I think about if the children of the future are going to grow food, mm. or how is their food going to come. I think about um, if we become uh, too much and too machine-like, are we going into a future of having robots cuddling our babies? That's scary. I think about that. It's pretty scary. That's scary to me. It's very scary. And some people are lining up to get microchips implanted and... Well, you know, so we have to make decisions. Yeah. We have to make a deci decisions as humans. And whatever your decision is, you know, let it go into a positive realm. Mm. Because if it's not in the positive, you know, you're going to end up in the valley of the road and you might not get out, you know? Yeah. So we have, we have two choices, to go back the old way of where we were two months ago, mm -hmm. okay? Or do we move into a better future? Yeah. Because it's always for the sake of the future generation, for our great-grandchildren, myself, great-grandchildren right now. Yeah. I worry about my great-grandchildren. I think about my children, my grandchildren, but I am worried about my great-grandchildren. They're inheriting the earth from exactly. us. Exactly. And what is it that we are handing to the future generations? Yeah. Yeah. Such deep and important questions to reflect on. And I know uh, through The Path, which is your organization, um, you know, you're doing wonderful things in that, in that regard. Um, I know you have a, a seed library, basically a mm -hmm. seed bank mm -hmm. where you've been preserving, you know, natural heirloom, organic seeds of all kinds of varieties, uh, from the earth for food, for growing food. Um, you have, uh, uh, you know, you give lectures and give talks and online, um, uh, healings and consultations and I mean you've done so much traveling teaching all around the world been a big part of the 13 indigenous grandmother uh, organization over the years um, but I want you to talk a little bit more about your organization the path and a little bit more about what you're doing there and how people can support mm -hmm. um, the path is the nonprofit and the path is basically the seeds. Mm -hmm. It's the building where the seeds are housed. I was able to receive a mandate, receive a vision from the beloved mother and she showed me on how to save seeds and also make seed bundles for the children that are being born. Yeah. This was the beginning of the whole thing. This was like in 2009. I have to tell you really quick. My, I was talking with Luna, my daughter, mm -hmm. telling her that you were coming here today. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, I remember Grandmother Florida Mao gave me a little seed bundle and mm -hmm. we planted it. And yeah. so she remembered that from a few years ago that yeah. when you gave that to her. So yeah. it's very yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And so um, the mother said to me, remind the parents that this bundle of seed should be taken care of like the living children, mm. the human children. Yeah. So we have to show respect for life that wow. way. Wow. That these seeds is life for the future. Yeah. And so this was like the beginning of this mandate. And I was able to travel, you know, out there into the cosmos receive more information on how I was going to bring this together. Yeah. And I started to fundraise. And I started to go back to the family land. And it became available. And so my mother-in-law purchased the land. It had been sold um, on an owner's contract. And so the land came back 
And so I started working with my visions and dreams a little bit more, putting everything together. And what I did was build a small building that is probably the basement where the seeds are kept. It, it's maybe about 10, 15 feet by 20, 25 feet. It's not very big. And this, I've been in there. It's and, very and it's, insulated. Yes, it stays it's nice and cool. Temperature control. Yeah. Temperature control yeah. environment. And then the upstairs is used for teaching. Yeah. Um, I'm not the person that is working with the seeds. Mm -hmm. My work is to pray. Yeah. And to manifest and to talk about it and to ask for donations yeah but I am NOT a farmer yeah I am NOT working in the field but I have done it and right now this very moment I am in love and with growing flowers well and you have a lot of gardens <laughs> just planted <laughs> yeah, around we your, just we just planted right? yeah um, a few gardens yeah. in my private house and also in the 40 acres yeah and so, um, so this is what's going on at the path. And right now, um, our seed keeper is uh, staying at the path. Um, and so for the moment, um, we have a dear friend that is there helping out, and li living and, and, and working there right now. Well, I just want to, I, I do want to say, you know, the importance of, that vision, that mandate from spirit that you got that, you know, preserving the seeds of our food for the future, like how critically important that really is yeah. with all of the small farms that have been taken over by giant conglomerate GMO, you know, huge monocrop uh, biomechanical farming. Basically, I mean, the giant tractors that run on remote controls and don't even have people driving them anymore. The chemicals that are being sprayed on the fields, the land that's being deteriorated, it's to this topsoil totally being destroyed, you know, the microorganisms in the soil. And, you know, and, and for some reason, it seems that certain billionaires, I'm not going to name any names, but you probably know who I'm talking about if you're watching this, that, are, that want to continue that in, in countries all over the world want to continue more GMO and more destruction of the planet and more owning of all of the all of patenting the seeds you know and and these are seeds that belong to the people that belong to the they earth belong that, to the people right there there is no um, and so uh, you're saying mon monetary exchange with you know with any of the seeds that we have that's we, what I want to say we, is that we, you're we, saving you're you're, we're, you're we're protecting them we're saving, you're preserving we're them protecting we're preserve protecting but the thing about it is that we have people that are seed growers that are growing the seeds. Beautiful. And so this, this is the whole um, um, essence of the path. Um, Flor de Mayo is Flor de Mayo, and Flor de Mayo is the one that goes out and, and does the lectures and talks about spirituality and talks about visions and dreams and is the woman of prayer. Yeah. But, um, you know, then I have the, the, t the, the, the caretaking of this building. And right now we are fundraising uh, to be um, self-sufficient uh, and we are looking into doing um, some um, solar energy mm. for the well. Beautiful. And solar energy to maintain um, the upstairs of the seed building uh, cool so that it continues to be temperature controlled without using any electricity. We're going to, we have a vision that we do not want to do that anymore. And so they're going to be um, um, kept by the, um, uh, by the energy of the sun. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, I want to I encourage everyone, go to followthegoldenpath.org, right? That's the main That's website, the main, followthegoldenpath.org. I'll put a link below as well. There's a donate button right there. Click it, super easy. Contribute in any way that you can. Help preserve these seeds for the future of humanity, the future of our children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren, mm -hmm. and 
you know, it, it helps support this beautiful work that uh, Grandmother Florida Mile is doing here on the planet and encourages all of us to get our hands in the dirt and remember the importance of seeds, of growing our own food, of, of uh, you know, remembering the, the, uh, our natural instinct to be connected to the earth and Absolutely. to have good, wholesome, organic, local food, flowers, herbs, you name it. Yeah. I mean, it's so yeah. important. Um, it's something, you know, we're, we're uh, uh, very passionate about in my family. We're, we're missing it a little bit here since we had to move in town for a little while, but we're mm -hmm. looking uh, to get uh, back out into some land and be growing all of our own food again um, and, and really excited about that. But I just love the work that you do and the wisdom that you share, and uh, I hope Thank people you. go to the website and help support and donate, and uh, just appreciate your time and for you being here, yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Greatly appreciate uh, being here and thank you so much yeah thank you everybody for listening uh, much love and light to everybody thank you so much take care bye